Last time I finished part of your outline on the interpreter, and um, I want to remind you that all of us are historically conditioned. Most of our problems in Bible interpretation come from what we think the Bible should say before we read it, and therein is the bias. We must allow Scripture to speak to us, and it's not easy. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe this is the sixth session of this seminar and I'm finally getting into the method itself. Everything before this was introductory. Now, it was introductory for this reason. I do not think Americans think they need to do anything about the way they interpret the Bible. And I think that we are terrible interpreters of the Bible. So to get your attention, I have drugged you, hopefully kicking and screaming, through some of the evangelical excesses um, and um, blinders and have tried to get your attention to show you uh, that we are using the Bible to back up our personal preferences and denominational training instead of allowing the Bible to speak to us. Now, if that's true, we're going to have to rethink. We're going to have to retool. We're going to have to make more effort at how do I understand this ancient book. And I want to submit to you again that the only proper way to interpret the Bible is to first understand it in light of the original inspired author's intent and then to try to bring that intent in an application or significance way into our day. The creativity is how we bring the ancient truth to the day, but there should not be any creativity on what the ancient truth is. The ancient truth should be documentable from history, literary context, unique grammatical features, contemporary word meaning, the type of genre or literature, and parallel passages. It is from this resource that we try to find the author's intent. And finally, I would say, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I would say the key to following the intent of the original author is to outline the entire book to paragraph level. So for the next uh, probably at least two times, I'm going to go over the... First of all, what I'm presenting to you is not something that I invented. I am sharing with you an ancient method, an ancient method that developed in Antioch of Syria in reaction to an allegorical method that developed in Alexandria, Egypt. Now what I have tried to do is put a modern structure on these ancient truths. Now, I explain that in two ways. It's like a a professional pilot or any pilot going through a takeoff checklist and a landing checklist, no matter how many times they've taken off and landing. Because the human mind skips steps. Even committed, sincere, dedicated human mind skip. So the airline pilot with lives in his hand goes through the checklist. Brothers and sisters, how much more responsibility do we have dealing with the eternal realities and consequences of the Word of God. We need a checklist. Have I thought about this? Have I pursued this? Have I looked at this? So I'm going to try to give you a checklist. Um, Tonight, I'm going to maybe go a little bit further than you have the notes for, but if that's true, next week we'll have the the notes for the end of tonight and, and, and next time. So follow with me, if you would. This is the general introduction to the method itself, which is called the historical, grammatical, lexical, theological method, (laughs) which just proves you've been to seminary. (laughs) Now, I try, you look in history and you say, is there any precursor to this? Is there any precursor in Judaism? Well, there are some hermeneutical principles, uh, particularly the Rabbi Aqaba and then Rabbi Hillel, But honestly, if you look at those principles, they would scare you to death because they have far more to do with um, folklore than they do with history and grammar and contemporary word meaning. So uh, there may be something of a precedent in how the rabbis allegorize the Mosaic law to make it applicable to Palestine of Jesus' day. So allegory was a minor part of the rabbis. And... um, Most of the rabbis have a literal, and I would even call it a lateral approach, 
where you add up the numbers of, of the letters and get a numerical value. And you can, if any other word adds up to the same, you can, uh, in, you know, interchange them. That's crazy hermeneutics. That destroys the intent of the original author. That, that completely ignores the historical literary context. And the Bible becomes something that we can make say anything. And I want to remind you of Garden Fee's statement. I think it's so good. A book that can mean anything means nothing. It's a powerful statement. The second precursor, and it's much more applicable, is the Alexandrian Jew intellectual Platonist named Philo. Now, Philo lived somewhat contemporary with Jesus. He was born a little earlier, in B.C., 20 B.C., lived to 55 A.D., he was not so much influential in Palestinian Judaism because he was not a rabbi and he lived in the diaspora. But he had a tremendous influence on the first Christian school of Bible interpretation that developed in Alexandria, Egypt. So let me quickly go through Philo and how he approached this. Page 27, if you follow with me. Now what the Greeks had done, you, you've heard of the writings of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's kind of their religion book. And they wanted to take the writings of Homer and make them applicable in ethics and morality and history and philosophy. Well, how do you take the, these hero stories from Mount Olympus and bring them into ethical philosophical, historical. Well, you allegorize them. You cut them off from their, their train of thought, their historical setting, their storyline, and you make the words mean something. You make the characters stand for something. Now, this became the precedent in Greek philosophical uh, schools uh, around the time of Philo and Jesus and Paul. Philo believed that the Holy Spirit uniquely spoke through Hebrew scriptures, but that also the Holy Spirit spoke through Greek philosophers. He was a Neoplatonist, and so he tried to find the, the writings and truth of Platonism in scriptures. Now, he did that in several ways. Now, will you notice beginning in D and E? He found hidden philosophical meanings in the Old Testament by purposefully disregarding the historical setting and the intent of the original biblical altar. If, if the text seemed unworthy of God, if the text had any preconceived inconsistencies, if the text had any historical problems that he thought were there, if he could allegorize it, he did. Now, I, I just want to spit... How many sermons in Baptist churches have I heard like this? Take some little text, make the words mean something they never intentionally meaned to teach some truth that the pastor wanted to teach. We call that spiritualizing or allegory. And it's alive and well and lives in Dallas and everywhere else. It's a manipulation of the Word of God to a personal theological agenda. There is no authority in the text because the interpreter has taken the authority. And it's, it's everywhere. We've got to fight it like the plague because it can make the Bible say anything by literalizing it and atomizing it and putting verses together that don't go together. You can make this ancient text say anything. Number F, they were particularly offended by the exclusiveness of Israel and the physicalness of God. So they removed all the unique passages about Israel being the unique covenant people. Those were offensive to them. They removed them, and they changed God. Heard the sound of God walking in the garden. God you know, he changed all those theophanies. Just took them, took them out and, and reduced them. Um, number G, and this is true not only of Philo. It's true of the Gnostics. It's true of liberals. They say we're trying to make the Bible relevant to our culture. I like what John Bazzano said. I remember being struck by this. He said, um, we don't have to defend the Bible or make it relevant. We have the line of the tribe of Judah. Turn him loose. Now, I agree with that. Far be it from me to make the word of God relevant. Amen? If there is no Holy Spirit, we need to get away from it anyway. 
If there is a Holy Spirit, you're not going to make it relevant. It's crazy what we do to make it relevant. It's what Gnostics did, make it relevant to Greek culture. And that's what we find people doing today. We've got to let the Bible be the only source for faith and practice as interpreted in the original author's intent. It's the only way to protect us from our own agendas. Um, look at number B. This developed, Philo, of course, was in Alexandria, large Jewish community there, intellectual community. And a Christian school developed there by some people that I'm sure you knew. This was probably the first large Christian school uh, in the ancient church. And I just want to go through some of this, if I could, with you. The first one to really be influenced by Philo's allegory is Clement, Clement of Alexandria. He lived from 150 to 216, and he developed five levels. Every verse in the Bible had five levels of interpretation. Now think what I just said. Every verse in the Bible, not every paragraph, not every literary, every verse in the Bible had five levels of interpretation. Now I've listed those for you, moving from the least significant to the most significant. The historical or literal sense was the least. A doctrinal sense made up of moral, religious, and theological issues. A prophetic or typological sense. A philosophical sense uses historical events and persons as representations of philosophical truths and categories. That's not really uh, Paul, that's wisdom. Or that's not really this city, it's truth. It's stuff like that. And then finally, the mystical or allegorical sense was what all of the really enlightened preachers looked for. And uh, this five levels uh, developed. The next, and this guy is called the brightest light in the ancient church. The most renowned of the ancient theologians from Alexandria is Origen. He followed Clement, 182 to 251. Now he combined, first of all, he was ticked off by the popular literalism of the Christians of his day. He really got turned off by that, and he reacted against it. So I'm, I'm, I'll find these quickly for you because I have them marked in my Bible. He combined two texts. Now, brothers, you just can't put two texts together unless they're meant to be together, right? So he quoted Proverbs 22, 20 and 21. I'm going to read it to you. Have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge to make you know the certainty of the words of truth, that you may correctly answer to him who sent you. Now, he combined that with 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Just put these two together. Here's, here's the Thessalonian text. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, he turned the five levels of Clement into the three levels of origin, body, soul, and spirit. Now look, look, at this, look at these notes and you'll see how he did it. It's amazing they do this, but, but they do it. The first one is the bodily sense, the literal sense, what it seems to say on the surface, but that's just for the common man. The second one is the soulish sense or moral sense. Now that's for educated people, leaders, merchants. And then, oh, the elite, the spiritual for the pneumaticoi, the, the, the preacher types, those who had time to study. That's the ultimate level. Now, do you see what that has just done? That has taken the Bible out of the hands of the common man to which it was given and put it into the hands of some kind of religious elite. God deliver me from the religious elite. The allegorical method used numbers in a symbolic way. Now, we, we could go to the Hebrew alphabet or the Greek alphabet, and it, the letters stand for numbers. If you add up the numbers, then supposedly you've got a numerical value for each word. Um, 666, that's a play on numbers. Uh, King of Kings comes out to 888, I think. There's all kind of a play on numbers. And they would use this as that's the deep truth found in this. Brothers, there is no deep truth found in the Bible. There's just what the original author intended. Now, there's poetry and there's paradox, but you don't need a guru, a PhD, a, a, a 140 IQ to find it. You need the Spirit of God in prayer. See, it's not this elite anything. 
Christians are elite because they're called by God and redeemed. But, well, I'm just fuming in my own juices. I'll get over it. <laughs> number 4B, numbers do have significance in the Bible. There is a number symbolism, a proper one. It's not connected to the alphabet. Now, I've tried to list some of them here. One, or the New Testament, sometimes three is, a, is, is used for God. Four is always the world, the four corners, the four winds, the four angels. Seven, the number of perfection, going back to Genesis 1. So one less than perfection is human imperfection, six. Number 10 seems to be, and that only seems to me, the number of, of uh, completeness, and then 12 is the number of organization. How many of the numbers in the Bible are made up of these or multiples of these? And whenever you see these numbers or multiples of these, you start thinking to yourself, this may have a symbolic meaning. But um, and I think there's a, pr there's a place for proper uh, numerology, but it gets so crazy and so weird so quick. Now, Ambrose, that's 340 to 379, he's the one who influenced Augustine, by the way, and his four levels of interpretation went from five to three and back to four. The literal teaches historical events, the allegorical, what you should believe, the moral, what you should do, and the mystical, what you should hope. Now, just giving you one example from Augustine here, you know, when Paul compares the two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Moriah, and he uses the word Jerusalem. Now, look how this would, would, would work. So, number A, it means the city in Palestine, Jerusalem. But number B, it's the church of Jesus Christ. Number C, it's the human soul. And number D, it's the revelation text about New Jerusalem coming out of heaven as a bride adorned or the title for all the people of God. Now, see, the problem is, it's not that these people haven't found a way where the city of Jerusalem is used in different senses. It is. But they would make every place that the word Jerusalem is found to hold these senses all at once so they can pick and choose what they want the Bible to teach here or there. There's the problem, is the slipperiness of the way interpreters put what they want, what they've been told, what they like in these texts, and then claims God's authority. Now, Augustine, I think he has somewhat of a pretty good book on Bible interpretation. The problem is, the big turkey never followed his own rules. So he said what he ought to do, and then he did allegory over and over and over, and it's just a problem. Now... One of my favorite books called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, if you're interested in another example of this, is Augustine's Sermon on the Good Samaritan. And it's, it's in, it's in that, that book by uh, Fee and Stewart, and it is basically that this is not a parable about racial stereotyping. Uh, no, this is a parable about how do you get to heaven from earth. And suddenly... The, the bandits become the demons and Satan, and the Good Samaritan is Jesus. Now, isn't that a crock that the Good Samaritan is Jesus? You don't know nothing about the ancient world if you can claim that. And then suddenly the church is the end, and the donkey is salvation, and the money paid. Yuck! And this was done in the name of God, and people went, oh, what a deep sermon. It was deep, all right, but... Now, number C, I have had to put in here, kicking and screaming, I've had to put this in here. I hope you're familiar with an a author, no, Mo Moises Silva. His, his book, Has the Church Misread the Bible? Yes, I believe the church has misread the Bible, but God wonderfully used even the allegorical method for a thousand plus years to communicate his gospel to the people of the Mediterranean and surrounding areas. So... I, there is some positive part of this, and I will, I will read this, though every time I read it, I get a rash personally. It attempted to use the Old Testament as a Christian document pointing to Christ. Two, it followed the example of Jesus, Matthew, 20, Matthew 13, Mark 4, the parable of the soils, and Paul, the typology on the two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Moriah, there, was, there is an al allegory or a typology in those two ones. It attempted to relate the gospel truth to their day. Oh, great. Now, they're going to make the gospel relevant, are they? Just like Philo and the Gnostics. And then the book is, Has the Church Misread the Bible? And my answer to that is a great book. It did show that God used this method. But yes, I believe the early church did misread the Bible. I believe the church is misreading the Bible today. Now, that is an arrogant statement on my part. I mean, you, you ought to just 
cringe when I say that. But what if I'm right? Turn Baptist into we don't spit, dance, or chew instead of Great Commission, Bible-loving, gospel-honoring people. Number D. Now, this is where I get so excited I feel like preaching again, but th this is the problems of the allegorical method. And may there be a curse on all of it. May the house fall on their head. It imported meaning into the text, personal meaning developed and thought of by the author of the allegory. It forced hidden meaning behind every text. The text can't mean what it seems to mean because of these different levels. It put forth fanciful and far-fetched interpretations. Oh, my soul. Have you ever read some of the midrash of the rabbis? It's the same kind of deal. It did not allow words and sentences to bear their obvious normal meanings. It allowed human subjectivity, the interpreter, to dominate the plain message of the original inspired author. The preacher becomes the focus. The, the, the author the modern writer becomes the focus instead of the only inspired person, which is the ancient author. There are no controls on interpretation, no way to evaluate an interpretation of allegory. You know, people say, well, the, the Lord spoke to me last night. Well, maybe you had heartburn. How do you know it was the Lord? And by the way, if the Lord speaks to you, you're responsible for it. But you've got to show me from the book for I'm responsible for it. Number seven, Martin Luther called it, Martin Luther, I don't know if you know, it's the most foul-mouthed preacher I ever read. Holy moly, Martin, woo. He called it clerical jugglers performing monkey tricks. A sort of beautiful harlot. You think Martin Luther liked allegory? I want to quote just a word from Basil of Caesarea. I know the laws of allegory, though less by myself than from others' works. Uh, there are those who do not admit the common sense of scriptures, for whom water is not water, but something else, who see a, in a plant, in a fish, what their fancy wishes, who changes the nature of reptiles and a wild beast to suit their allegories, like the interpreters of dreams who explain visions and sleep to make them serve their own ends. For me, grass is grass, plant, fish, wild beast, domestic animal. I take it all in a literal sense, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. <laughs> There's no hidden truth here, my friends. My best, I think my best analogy for this is that the Bible is like a banquet table. All the wonderful foods of God from this planet just on a table. And he says to his people, come, eat. Eat all you want. Eat everything you want. Come. And we've turned it into, you've got to pay a price. You've got you to go to school. You've got to have a guru. You've got to have a priest. You gotta, no, no, no. This table is for you. You can come and eat all you want, any time you want. Ah. There are two extremes, in my opinion, allegory and literalism. The Bible is a library, a library of literary works related to a specific time and culture. Would you buy that? Now think what I just said, because it's not easy. God chose to speak at a particular time to a particular culture. Everything in that culture was not the will of God, but he chose to speak to that culture in a way they could understand. Now, the real question is, how do I know, as a Bible interpreter, what is cultural and what is eternally relevant? And that is not an easy question to answer. In my study, the book that has helped me the most in this terrible area of how do you separate the shaft of the Word of God from the, the seed has been Garden Fee and Doug Stewart, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And here's what they say. You can believe it or reject it, but I want you to think about it. If the Bible is uniform on a subject, Old Testament and New Testament, they all say the same thing, it's probably a universal. If the Bible speaks with what they call two voices, the Old Testament is against it, but the New Testament is not against it, or two places in the New Testament, one seems to approve it, one seems to reject it, then it's probably a cultural item. And the cultural items are always that which is non-moral, that which really does, like wearing veils in church, uh, greeting each other with a holy kiss, um, women not wearing pantsuits to church. I, I just cannot tell you how grieved I get when we kill each other over women can't wear pants. Where, where'd you get that? Nobody wore pants in the Old Testament. Everybody know pants? 
Women had one kind of robe. Men had one kind of robe. Women's robe had blue decoration. The only way you got pants is to grab between your legs, pull your robe through, and tuck it in your belt, girding up your loins. You don't think women girded up their loins when they washed clothes? There's no gird knot. <laughs> and we let people do that to us. Oh, women can't wear pantsuits. And we buy it. Oh, my, help me. The last one, number 10, I must admit this to you. It's embarrassing, but I must admit it to you. The, the method that I am going to talk about is a method that got disciplined out of existence almost by the Roman Catholic Church. God did use allegory for hundreds of years in, in many, many countries to communicate to the saved and the lost. Um, I thank God for that but I still cannot allow that to happen today. I, I get so worried when in Jesus' name people like Jim Jones poison hundreds of people and people reflect on Christianity negatively. Or somebody comes along and interprets the Bible in a weird way. I cannot let modern preachers, even that I agree with, use a method that can be so manipulated to the intent and weirdness of the interpreter. We've got to go back to the, the key of understanding the Bible as originally written. Now, we allow freedom in interpretation, but all of us have the right to say, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? Roman numeral two is the method that I'm going to be dealing with now for, for several weeks. And this is called, it, it, it's often called the literal approach, but that does not mean you take every passage literally. It means if the author wrote poetry, you interpret it as poetry. If they wrote apocalyptic, you interpret it as apocalyptic. You take the author's choice of genre seriously. I've heard someone say, and, and I, think, I think it was Bruce Corley from over at Southwestern said, and I like this so much, that the author's choice of genre is a contract with the reader on how to interpret it. Now, that is very, very true. If it's parable, and uh, what I'm giving you basically is what we call general hermeneutics that apply to all text, but in a week or two, I will talk about special hermeneutics that apply to certain kinds of text. So right now, we're just dealing with this as, as literature in general. So this is called the literal or the historical grammatical school. I've listed some of the people you might be familiar with that helped start this school in the city that sent out Paul and Barnabas as missionaries, Antioch of Syria. You notice there's Lucian and um, Theodora Mopsa Wepsa is a famous one. Chrysostom, Golden Mouth is another one. These are the bright lights of this particular school. And this is the school that I advocate. This is the school that I'm trying to share with you with a methodology that I have developed, but the, the main points from this ancient school. Now, notice the ABCs underneath, if you would. Um, there is something of a precedent in the rabbis, particularly Aqaba and Hillel, but not a whole lot. This method focuses... Now, l let me read this every word precisely. On the plain, obvious, ordinary, common sense meaning of words and sentences. Somebody said to me, what is the most important, important thing in Bible interpretation? And I remember so much Garden Fee saying, I was so shocked first time I heard it. The most necessary thing in Bible interpretation is common sense. Think about that. Common sense. It tried to understand the original author's intent and interpret in light of his, not our, historical setting. Because it is textual focused, it came to be called the historical grammatical school of interpretation. It did become involved in a heresy called Nestorianism. Now, Nestorianism is a fight over how many natures did Jesus have. Would he have one human nature and a second divine nature? Well, the Bible says he had one nature, fully God and fully man. So it did get off into a heresy. And the Roman church did discipline them, rightfully so. So they had to leave Antioch of Syria and they moved to Persia. And it kind of pretty much lost its influence there. But in the classical Protestant reformers, it returned again. It first showed up in an author called Nicholas of Lyra. And then that's who influenced Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Zwingli. 
So the Protestant Reformation is an example exactly of the literary and hermeneutical approach that I'm trying to share with you. Um, K authored um, precepts, exactly the same hermeneutical approach. Um, the brother out in California at the Bible Church, his name just slipped me, John, John MacArthur, exactly the same approach. I am not some weird person. I just shout more than normal people. So um, I'm saying to you, this is a standard understanding of how to interpret the Bible, and it's worth your time, and that's why you're here, thank God for you, to think through these issues. Because people need to know what God says to these issues. And if we just give our personal preference or our denominational indoctrination or our particular American 21st century spin, we are not giving the Word of God. We've got to be able to go back and say, here's the text that I think answers that need, that problem. Here is the wisdom that God wants to give you in this situation. And we've got to do it by the original author's intent and not by our particular desires or training. It's basic tenets, bottom of page 29. The Bible is written in normal human language. Now, I want to quote a couple of quotes by James Sire. Now, he is an English professor. I believe he is the president of InterVarsity Press now. This little book he wrote called Scripture Twisting. I used to use it in my hermeneutical class because it, uh, <laughs> it's out of print. You can get it on Amazon.com cheap. It's a little paperback, but it would, it would take a Maharishi Yogi Yucky's view of the Bible or some weird person from over this other part of the world, and it would show how they abused the Bible. And those Baptist preachers in that class, boy, their eyes would pop open because they heard sermons just like that. It skinned them without them knowing they were skinned. And uh, we all do this. So let me read a couple of James Sire's quotes, a very insightful book. The illumination comes to the minds of God's people, not just the spiritually elite. There is no guru class in biblical Christianity, no Illuminati, no people through whom all proper interpretation must come. So while the Holy Spirit gives special gifts of wisdom and knowledge and spiritual discernment, he does not assign these gifted Christians to be the only authoritative interpreters of his word. Now listen to this, please. It is up to each of his people to learn, to judge, to discern by reference to the Bible, which stands as the authority even over those whom God has given special abilities. We will stand before God for what we believe the Bible says and how we live it. Not what I think, not what your mother thinks, not what your neighbor thinks, not what your preacher thinks, what you think and how you've lived it out. Second quote. To summarize the assumption I'm making throughout the entire book, Scripture Twisting, is that the Bible is God's true revelation to all humanity, that it is our ultimate authority on all matters about which it speaks, that it is not a total mystery, but can be adequately understood by ordinary people, pardon me, in every culture. And that's the assumption I'm bringing. Reading the Bible and asking the Holy Spirit to help. You won't understand everything. You won't solve all the historical mysteries. You won't be able to take away the paradoxes. There are texts that no one understands. That when you ask God to help you know how to live and what to believe to honor Him, I believe He'll do it. Because I still believe the Bible, the Spirit, and you are priority. Do you hear what I've just done? I've diminished my position as a teacher and raised your position as a child of God. It's exactly how it should go. Number B, the Bible must be interpreted in light of its own historical setting and literary context. Number C, the intent of the original inspired author as expressed in the text is the focus of interpretation. I don't want you reading between the lines. I want you to show me in the text what you believe and why, and I've got to give you a freedom to believe and live if you can show me in the text. I can't cut off the discussion because I like it or don't like it or it's out of my tradition or it's something I never heard. No, I've got, got to be willing to look at the text. Texts are authoritative. My interpretation is not authoritative. Roman numeral four, what I've tried to do is, is develop seven questions, seven interpretive questions 
that we should run Bible passages through. It's the takeoff and landing list for pilots. It's the mechanic with the toolbox and all the different tools. Many times some of these questions will not affect the text you're dealing with. But boy, when they affect, they affect. So here is the list of questions. Number one, what did the original author say? And I'm, this, I'm dealing with textual criticism because I do not believe that handling snakes and drinking poison is part of God's will for humanity. Now, you've got to decide that. And I, it's not going to be some heavy something where I tell you, go learn Greek. I don't think you need to do that. But you need to look in the margin of your modern study Bible, and when it says, not in the oldest and best manuscripts, don't build a doctrine on that text. There are other texts that teach that doctrine. What did the original author mean? Now, this is what we call exegesis, from the word to lead out. What we don't want to do is lead in, eisegesis, which means read our meaning, our Baptist, our 21st century, whatever into it. We want to make sure God is speaking to us, not us telling God what he ought to say. Now, in this particular section, I'm going to develop four reading cycles. And I think we ought to be at least willing to read the literary unit that we're dealing with. If we're trying to interpret Matthew 6, you've got to read Matthew 5 through 7. If you're going to interpret Revelation, I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, you've got to read 1 Corinthians 11 through 14. If you're going to deal with one of the letters to the seven churches, you've got to deal with at least Revelation 2 and 3. See, what we're doing is taking little pieces out. You would just die if someone took a little piece out of a letter you wrote, didn't even read the front of the last. That's what we're doing to God. So we've got to... We've got these reading cycles are just forcing our mind to pick up certain points of information before we claim to speak for God. What an awesome responsibility it is to claim to speak for God. And we're going to stand before him for it. Number three, what did the biblical author say elsewhere? This is parallel passages. Now, for those of you in seminary, thank God for you, we would call this biblical theology. We're limiting the scope to a certain author or a certain genre certain period. What did Paul say about this? What did John say about this? What did Peter say about this? Biblical theology, parallel passages, limited. And of course, there's concentric circles of this. The, most, the primary ones are in the same book. Then the next concentric circle is the same author. And then other New Testament or Old Testament authors. Then the whole Bible, systematic theology. And these, these parallel passages are an attempt to let an inspired text be interpreted by inspired text. Uh, the next one is, what did biblical authors say, other bi biblical authors say on the same subject? Parallel passages, systematic theology. How did the original hearers understand it? This is historical and literary context. Now, sometimes I have what they said and didn't say. Sometimes in sermons we hear what the response is. But we're looking for the historical setting of the author and saying, what would the people in that time and that place have understood this biblical author to say? The next one, um, how does the uh, original message apply to my day? Now, that's cultural application. And finally, how does the original message apply to my life? Bible interpretation without personal application is an abomination to God. It is not how much you know, it's how much you live what you know. Amen? We don't need to know more about the Bible. We need to act on what we already know in the Bible. Wouldn't God be pleased if we acted on what we knew? Most of us don't need more information. We haven't done what we know is the appropriate thing to do. And yet we want to win Bible trivia and embarrass the in-laws. <laughs> Five more minutes and you can have a business meeting, okay? <laughs> Let me try to finish this section. Um, these seven questions and four reading cycles will be used in this seminar as stages of interpretive methodology. Now, Roman numeral five is this first question establishing the original text. So we're going to talk about this is somewhat of a, 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 a redo of the manuscript issue in the section on the Bible. But, but this, I think... I think has, has more relevance. So I just want to jump real quickly to, to A2 and then close it tonight. Must we know ancient Hebrew, Royal Aramaic, and Koine Greek to really interpret the Bible? 
Now, will you please tell me, first of all, all of us have Greek in seminary. Do you think any of us who have two or three or four years of Greek know Greek? We can't even order at a Greek restaurant. How many people in the world are fluent in first century Mediterranean Greek? Greeks aren't. Greeks can't read it. So you mean to tell me God gave us a written message, but it's only good for those who are fluent in an ancient language? How many people in the world ever know those languages? Point zero, 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 zero what? No, 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 no. God wants to communicate to us. Translations adequately communicate. Do we miss something of the nuance? Sure. Do we miss something of the words that... Yes. But we perfectly know enough to live a life pleasing to God because this is His Word through His Spirit given to His church and most, the vast majority of His church only have a translation. When I go do uh, partnership missions, and I, I've done a lot of them, over 30 of them through the years, taking people with me. I remember particularly in Brazil, whenever you go into a home, I always ask, can I see your family Bible? Do you have a Bible in your home? Because I want them to see that what I'm sharing with them is not out of my Bible, but out of the Bible sitting on their shelf unused for so many years. I cannot tell you how many people I have led to Christ through the Jehovah Witness translation. I don't use John 1, 1 in my presentation of the, of the gospel. And we could fight over torture stake versus cross, but I guarantee you the issue of who is Jesus Christ is as real in, the, in, in that, that translation as any other. We, we're not going to use translation as an excuse not to live for Christ. The problem is we're not reading any translation. Lord, uh, thank you for the interest that these have in being better interpreters, interpreters that can back up what they say to others who are hungry, lost, and needy, other Christians who are seeking. Lord, thank you for Christians who are willing to pay the price to know what they believe and why. I pray you'd bless them. Lord, I feel like the church has lost her way, lost her way in tradition, been captured by society lost the power and the radicalness of Jesus' message. Lord, you brought the Reformation by getting us back to Bible truths. I pray you would cleanse us and purify us and help us to return to the authority and preeminence of Scripture. Thank you for the freedom and personalities that many times there's a different way to apply this or understand it. Thank you for that freedom. But God, in a day of such relativity, in a day of post-modernity, post-Christian, God, thank you there's a word that is not all so soft and fuzzy and whatever you believe is okay. Thank you that you've spoken to us. Help us recapture that message for our life and our day. Help us to speak on the authority of biblical truth. And thank you, Lord, that you have not left us awash in the subjectiveness of our age. In Jesus' name, amen.